church. Let's just worship him for a few more moments this morning. Jesus, we are so grateful to be in your presence, God. Jesus, we are so grateful to feel you in this room. God, the strength that you give, we thank you for it, Jesus. It's good to be back here with everyone. I think this is probably the longest I've not been in church in my whole life. We were discussing yesterday that the last time we were here for service was the Christmas service, which was December 19th. And it's, it was three weeks ago. Pretty long time, I must say. I have missed you all. I probably don't express that uh, the correct way because I'm a weird introvert person. All my introverts in the room, just nod your head. We know you won't yell, so. <clears throat> but I very much missed being with all of you um, as you're aware a lot of family has experienced um, dealing with COVID and then there are still many in our church that are fighting with that still. Um, Sister Lisa is in the hospital still currently. I believe Sister Nadine is in the hospital as well. Um, so we're going to go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Specifically for Sister Lisa, um, the Weisbergers, Sister Nadine, Sister Marta and her mother as well as Sister Joyce. mic cut out obviously if you know anyone else please go ahead and pray for them but let's let's bind together church as the body of Christ we know that he hears our prayers we've seen that he's moved in our prayers already so let's let's go before him now Jesus we thank you again for this opportunity to be in your presence God wherever we are whether we're in this building physically whether we're watching online wherever we are Jesus we know that you can meet with us and that you hear our prayers God, we come before you right now for these specific people, God, that we know that are struggling with sickness or things in their life right now. God, we pray for Sister Lisa that you would reach down, that you would give her a special touch this morning, that you would give her strength in her body. Sister Nadine, Jesus, that you would give her a special touch and strength. God, the Weisbergers, Sister Marta and her mother, Sister Joyce, Jesus, there are so many needs in this church family right now. God, we know that you have the answer. God, that you have the power to take care of all of these needs. And we come before you, Jesus, and we thank you for it with praise and thanksgiving right now. In Jesus' name, let's worship him, church. Oh, come on, let's worship him. He's going to do miracles this week. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you are worthy, God. We're going to go ahead and get right into the word. <laughs> you know, I feel a little silly. Pastor Gillis texted me that list and just said, don't forget to pray for these people. We need to pray for Pastor and Sister Gillis, in case you didn't already. We're going to do that again for them. But Pastor Gillis was actually here this morning, uh, was planning to be here, and then ended up having to go home. He was still feeling very poorly. Sister Gillis is feeling poorly as well. Uh, I think they're through the bulk of it, but just some of you that have been through it know the lingering effects. Um, so let's go before our pastor, or go before God right now for our pastor, our pastor's wife again. Jesus, we ask you for the special touch right now for Pastor and Sister Gillis. Jesus, that you would reach down to that room. You would give them strength in their bodies and their minds. God, that you would encourage them. Jesus, I already said how difficult it was for me for not to not be here for these last few weeks but this is our pastor god we pray for him right now that you would raise him up god that you would give him strength in his body and a special touch right now jesus that you would touch sister gillis that you would help her through this the rest of the way god that you would renew her strength in jesus name we pray amen We've had this saying around my house the last few days, or maybe last week. Well, that was a COVID brain move. <laughs> no, that was my COVID brain today. And you all get to listen to me preach. I sound weird. Uh, apparently my brain doesn't work right. So we're gonna pray that God's anointing just takes over and he just speaks for me. 
that's what he needs to do anyway, but especially, especially today. We're going to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14, verse 14, very familiar passage of scripture. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will hear, heal their land. I know we've prayed a bunch of times already, but if we could one more time, ask that God would touch each one of our hearts this morning. I believe that God has something special and maybe deep to say to us this morning as we kind of start this year and continue on what Brother Mike preached about last week. So let's go before him and, and ask that he would touch our hearts. Jesus, God, we ask that you would touch our hearts and our minds right now. God, open our hearts to we may be soft ground to receive your word this morning and allow it to change us. Jesus, ask you to please anoint me as I speak your word. Jesus, give me strength in my mind and my body to speak your word clearly the way that you would have it be spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My title for today is simply Surrender. So what does it mean to surrender? If you look at the dictionary, because I'm one of those people that like to look up what a word means, especially when I'm going to use it for something, a few of the definitions are to abandon oneself entirely to a powerful emotion or an influence to give in. Another is to submit to the power of another, especially after resisting. And then another definition is to give up control of something to someone else. I have to say, as human beings, and I would probably go a step further, and no offense to everyone else, but as Americans, we don't view the word surrender as a nice word, right? We'll do all things. Surrender is not in our vocabulary, you know, and all that one. We never surrender. All that wonderful stuff. We're Americans. We don't give up. We don't give in. We're taught to fight and never give up, right? Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. In a lot of situations, it's a good thing to to not give in. It's a good thing to fight and and to stand for what's right and to stand for what we believe in and, and fight for our health, fight for all of those things. All that's wonderful. But for the most part, we see surrender as a bad thing. Often in other cultures, not just the American culture, it's viewed as a sign of defeat to surrender. But to surrender means that we would lay aside our views and our thoughts, and that's very contrary to the way of life of Americans, right? <laughs> Come on, let's, let's be real. I, I guess it's probably the whole world, but we live in America, and that's kind of what we see the most, and all of our friends and the people that we see on social media, and all the people that we see in entertainment industry, and all of these wonderful things, and everybody wants to give their opinion and their thoughts. And they want you to surrender to their thoughts and their idea. Ironic, isn't it? But nobody actually wants to surrender to anybody else's. This is my way. I don't really care what you think about it. This is the way it is, right? Yay, American. <laughs> this is what we do. <clears throat> and, you know, we see that not only do we struggle with this idea of surrender for ourselves, and it's kind of a bad word, but... We also find <laughs> when someone surrenders, we all have a comment, don't we? Like, wow, really? You're going to give up? Oh, wow, really? You're going you're gonna to just give in to that? What are you thinking? Everybody has their immediate comment, and we all are wonderful armchair quarterbacks, aren't we, with everyone else's life. And we say, you, should, you gave up too early, man. Just, just keep fighting. You, you know, you'll get this. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have given in. You should have done it this way. We all have our views, and we like to push them at other people, maybe just to ourselves. But we sit in our little chair and we say, hmm, "I would have done it like this. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have surrendered." I think I've made the point that surrendering is a bad thing. I think we see it right. Everybody's really quiet today. Oh my god. 
<clears throat> I would say what Brother Mike says. What does that mean? When you guys are quiet, that means you haven't gotten it. I'm going to have to keep repeating it. I'm going to steal his line. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to steal Brother Mike's line. So we see surrender as a bad thing. It's ingrained to us as children for the most part. Never surrender. It's mottos. It's, it's, it's there. And then we step into church, and we have our walk with God, and the first thing we run into is, you need to surrender. Wait, what? This is against everything that I've been taught. And I recognize that surrendering in life is most often not a good thing. I get it. I'm not here to just say we should give up and give in to everything. We should just stop trying and, and all of that wonderful stuff. But I am saying that too often we carry that attitude of never surrender into our walk with God. And we try to serve God with that attitude of never surrender. And it just it doesn't work, does it? Yeah, and some of us will say, well, you know, I just have that attitude with the devil. In my walk with God, I'm never going to surrender to the devil. But too often, when we have that strong of a stance, it ends up coming against God. Whether it's out of wanting to do it our way, or feeling like we know it better, or honestly, sometimes we struggle with surrendering because we have shame and we feel like we have to fix it before we can surrender it. You know, we, maybe we come in and we understand how much God loves us, and we understand that, you know, he wants to help us, and he wants to forgive us, and we say, okay, God, that's, that's great. I want to surrender to you, so let me get you something worth surrendering, and then I'll surrender it. In theory, it's not a bad plan, right? That's kind of a nice thing to do. You know, if, somebody's been, if somebody was bugging you to, I don't know, this is a terrible example, but surrender a car to them. Okay, and you've been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. This car is in terrible shape. And then finally you're like, okay, you know what? This person is a really nice person. I should give them this car. Let me clean it up first. Right? I mean, I think maybe maybe don't raise your hand, actually. <laughs> I don't want to find out who, who wouldn't. But I think most of us would probably at least take it through the car wash, mm, vacuum it out a little bit, and then turn it over, right? And we try to do that with our life, with God. And we say, okay, God, but I have all these things. I got to fix it. And then I can give you all of my time and my effort, and you can use me to do great things because I cleaned up first, and I'm ready to go. But that's not what he's asking. Truly, the only way to live for him is to completely surrender to him as is. Where we are, with what's going on. We can't live by our views. We can't make it to heaven by our ways. We can't give him the things that we want to and hold back the things that we don't want to give up. The only way is to surrender everything. The good, the bad, everything. So, in this surrender, we see that some things happen. You know, it, it gives us a new life when we surrender to God. Now, again, I get it. In our human nature and, and humanity itself, when people surrender, it usually doesn't go well for them, right? <laughs> they may escape with their life, but throughout history, most of the time, that means that somebody else now has the rule and they're going to punish you for the things that you did, which led up to all of the surrendering, right? You know, there's going to be all these rules. You know, we see in, you know, in world wars, and we go through and we see that when countries would surrender, you know, there would be all of these stipulations attached to that. Well, now you can't have a military. You can't have this. You can't have that. You need to follow all these things. And all of these things are imposed. So, again, here we are us wonderful American human beings, and we say, mm -hmm. so what, I'm going to give in to God, and then he's going to smash me with a hammer because now he's in charge? That might be our, our first thought, and, and I get it, but when we surrender with God, we, we no longer find ourselves in, in control, and while that might be scary for some of us that like control, 
it's actually not a bad thing, right? What better hands could we give into? You know, what, what better person could we surrender to? Who, who would know better for us the plans that they have that aren't for evil but are for good, his word says. The one that's preparing a place for us. The one that shed his blood so we could be free of sin and have relationship for him, with him. That's who we're giving control over to. That's who we're surrendering to. If we go back to kind of the, the first part of of this message and, and some of the scripture we talked about in the beginning. There's something about surrendering, I guess I should say not surrendering. It maybe goes further than we would expect. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe you're sitting here today and you say, I know I haven't surrendered everything, but you know, is it really that bad? Yes. Not surrendering keeps us opposed to God. It puts us in a place of opposition with God. One of the definitions of surrender stood out to me as I looked at the definitions for this word. And, and at first I was kind of like, oh, well, I'm not going to say that one. Because, you know, there are definitions. There's like 6,000 different definitions for a word. So I looked at it and I was like, hmm, that doesn't seem like it. Fits. Like, yes, it's part of the word, but it doesn't really apply in this context. And then as I went through preparing, I kind of came back to it and I was like, okay, well, actually, maybe it does. And that definition says to cease resistance to an enemy or opponent and submit to their authority. So at first, I admit, I was kind of like, mm, that's not a good one for this context. But actually, yes. Also, yes, it is. Because when we don't surrender to God, we are opposed to him. He is our enemy. We said, wow, right? I just said God is the enemy. God is our opposition. We are, we are in opposition with God. That's what happens when we don't surrender. The things that we hold back are in opposition to him. Whatever it is that we don't surrender, if it's sin, whether it seems to be sin to us, whether something, something that we withhold from God is sin. Isaiah 59 makes some things very clear. I'm going to skip through this chapter a little bit. Verses 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot slave, save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. How many times have we heard that scripture? And we celebrate. Like, awesome. That means he, he, you know, he hears us. He's not going to hold back. But it continues. It says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that, you will, that he will not hear. Wow, right? Skipping down to verses 12 and 13 says, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Not happy scriptures. Our sin, our iniquity, the things that we don't surrender and relinquish control over, are things against God. They are things that are opposed to God. I think it's probably safe to say that if you're in this building today or you're watching online or whatever, you don't purposefully want to be opposed to God. Pretty good chance that you're looking to get closer to God or maybe figure out who God is or understand or de develop your walk with God better, not be opposed to him. Unfortunately, doing the things that we want to do, doing the things that feel good to us, the things that we don't want to give up or surrender to him, put us in a place of opposition automatically. And that's, and that's hard to hear. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. When I opened up my Bible app and Isaiah 59 was there, 
because I switch back and forth. I do most of it on most of my reading on my phone, and I did it on my iPad today. So apparently, at some point in time, I left off on Isaiah 59. When I opened that up and read it, I was like, "Whoa, that's like a straight up gut punch." Man, this is some some tough stuff. But the scripture that we read through and the scripture that we open with also makes it plain that while we may be in that place of opposition, we may have those things that we're not comfortable with surrendering yet. If we will do it, there are things that will follow. The scripture we open with makes it plain that if we humble ourselves, surrender is a humbling act. Right? Surrender is saying, I give up control. I give you authority over me. You know, when we, when we think about it in the terms of, you know, even bad things, surrender, what we do, we put our hands up, right? Because for the most part, unless you're some kind of crazy martial artist type person, you can't do much when your hands are like this. It's going to take you a second to make a move, and that person can then react. So it's kind of a, a place of humility, really. Standing there, looking like a dork with your hands up in the air, saying, okay, I, I surrender, right? Surrender is a humbling act. While in this world, it's often an act of forced humility. It's something that's forced on someone to surrender. And that humility is kind of is pushed on that person or that country or whatever, whatever case is as we look throughout history. In our walk with God, it should be an act of true and willing humility. A free act from us that says, I surrender. I, I give in. I'm done trying to do it my way. I'm done being in opposition to you. I'm done. All of these things that I shouldn't be doing, even the things that, you know, I don't think are really bad, but... If, I'm, if I need to surrender everything, I'm surrendering everything. This is where I am. The scripture says that then God will heal our land. Then he will fix the things that are broken. Then he will fix our things. You know, the same passage in Isaiah 59 that greatly details our transgressions and how they separate us from God also ends... In verses 19 through 21, noting, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, say the Lord, As for me, this is my covenant with them. My spirit that is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of your mouth, nor of the mouth of thy seed, or the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. This is the God that we are surrendering to. He sees all the things that we do. He sees all the things that we've done that have been in opposition to him. He sees the outright sin. He sees the things that we lie about and say, even against him. He sees our false accusations. He sees our anger. He knows the fight that we've put up against him. But instead of proclaiming that he will now be in charge and we will now suffer before him because of all the things that we did before we surrendered, he instead promises forgiveness. He instead promises healing. He provides a covenant for our salvation and our protection. When we turn from our transgressions, when we turn and we surrender whatever it is, he is so quick to heal and to forgive. It's all throughout his word. We see the woman that broke the alabaster box at Jesus' feet. That very thing that had been earned from a life of sin. She surrendered it. She gave it to him. We see the parable of the prodigal son. That he went out and he did all of the things that were in opposition to his father. And yet, when he turned to come back home, his father was there watching, waiting for him. 
That is the kind of God that we are surrendering to. He is ready and waiting for our surrender. He is ready and waiting to forgive, to fix, to heal. It's time, church. Why don't we stand? Brother Dion, if you would just come back. It's time for us to truly surrender, to stop fighting, stop giving our reasons and our excuses, and just surrender. To surrender to his power, to truly let him take complete control in our lives. I know it may be a little bit cliche since it's the first, second, whatever, second week of a new year. But church, let's not go through this year avoiding surrender. Let's take the opportunity that we've been given. Don't wait three months from now. Don't wait six months from now, nine months from now, the end of the year and say, man, oh, I should have done that a long time ago. Because so often I've found in, in my walk with God, when, when we give in, we stop fighting and we just do what he says to do. It's like, wow, that was a lot easier. I should have done that a long time ago. Church, I don't want to go through this year with that regret. I don't want to go through this year saying, man, I should have surrendered earlier. I should have, I should have given that thing. I should have given that time, that effort. I should have given my all earlier. To this morning, Brother Dion is just going to play the piano softly. And I would just, I would love to see this place full of people surrendering. Whether it's physically standing there with your hands raised, whether it's in your at your pew on your knees praying whether it's standing there praying however it is for you i don't know but let's find a place of surrender this morning church don't leave this place still holding back don't leave this place still carrying that weight and not being willing to let it go let's just take some time this morning and seek his face and really truly surrender to him
Church, this is a daily thing. I think for the most part, probably all of us at some point have quote unquote stat surrendered our life to God. But is this something we have to do every day? Like every day there's something to surrender to Him. Whether it's something that's wrong, something we're doing wrong, or whether it's an attitude that we picked up or fear or anxiety or doubt. Every day, church, we need to find a place of surrender this year. To start out our days having already surrendered to him. And let's see what it will do for the church. Let's see what it'll do for our lives this year if we live a life of surrender. Amen. Don't have any announcements today. Um, you'll just keep everyone in prayer as we go through this week. And hopefully <laughs> everything will kind of get back to normal here soon. Uh, it's been very odd, I'm sure, for everyone. So even though, even if you've been here, even if you're here last week or you're here this week, everything is different. So let's all pray that everyone can get back here soon and quickly and healthy and this church will move forward this year amen and you are dismissed please be safe getting home it's kind of slippery and icy out there don't want anybody to fall